It's time to make something happen, where a local conversation makes a global impact. Executive producer, Altogether Marketing, LLC. Producer, Audrey M. Wiggins. This is a Mason Wiggins Media Group production. Our topic for today is the Project 400, our lived experience. It's actually a conference that kicks off a year-long worth of activities, starting with Cleveland State University. And our guests today are Dr. Ronnie Dunn and Dr. Thomas Bynum. The conference will frame the historical and contemporary effects of slavery and institutional and structural racism in the perpetuation of racial disparities and inequities found among the African-American population today. And we'll hear from Dr. Dunn and Dr. Bynum on the other side of this message. One of the most fundamental parts of doing business on the web is keeping your customers' information safe. Fear of hacking and other security breaches still makes a lot of people jittery about disclosing their credit card numbers and other private information online, like their home address and telephone number. And if they suspect that it could be compromised when they make a transaction on your site, they're going to take their business elsewhere. That's why you need an SSL certificate for your website. Hello, I'm Audrey, and it's time to make something happen. Thank you for tuning in to our show today. We have some awesome guests um, from Cleveland State University. We will be interviewing Dr. Ronnie Dunn. He's the Interim Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer and also the Associate Professor of Urban Studies. And we also have Thomas Bynum. He's the Director of Black Studies Program and Associate Professor of History. So thanks, Dr. Bynum and Dr. Um, for Dunn for being here today. Thank you for having yes, us. Yes, absolutely. So um, the topic of our show today is Project 400, um, our lived experience. So it's a major conference um, coming up this weekend. It's, it's kicking off a year-long um, project of, of events and observations. And um, so Cleveland State University and multiple community partners will inaugurate a year-long observation of the arrival of the first Africans brought to the British colonies in North America in 1619. Project 400, our lived experience, will present a series of events that examine slavery's foundational significance to the historic and contemporary challenges faced by African Americans, acknowledging the obstacles that have been overcome while highlighting those that still remain. So um, we have a lot of spirited conversation off camera. Let's try to um, capture some of that <laughs> <laughs> in our interview today. <laughs> yeah, so um, and I'll just to start off giving us a little background, um, Dr. Dunn, mm -hmm. on Project 400, our lived experience. Sure. Uh, well, this um, conference, this idea of commemorating or observing this historic moment actually um, it stemmed from a conversation that Thomas and I had when I initially came to the role of Chief Diversity Officer last uh, July of 2018. Okay, very um, well, I, it, it struck me, I mean, it's, I'm uh, you know, a student of history as well. Um, while I'm an urban sociologist, I also uh, am uh, somewhat of, not like Thomas, a, a pure historian, but a student of history. So. I was always cognizant of the fact that this is the 400 year anniversary okay. when we were coming up upon it. So, um, having not having heard anything uh, being discussed about plans at the city level or anywhere in the greater Cleveland area to uh, observe and commemorate this historic moment, I. Um, contacted Thomas and, and Presser Pickett over in the African American Cultural Center mm -hmm. and we had a discussion about the okay. need to do something. So that's where uh, this, this, this emanated originally. Uh, there was still a little time passed before we actually convened uh, a planning committee and started planning in earnest to make sure that this, this uh, moment in history did not go unobserved. Absolutely, and actually it's, it's garnered um, national attention, hasn't it? Yes, absolutely it has. Uh, the New York Times has a, um, I think theirs is entitled Project 1690. And uh, so they have, uh, at a national level, raised this, uh, uh, this issue to the attention of the country. Absolutely, yes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and, um, and Dr. Bynum, um, tell us how your um, your role in, in the project is, is going on. So it's, I it's, keep calling it a project, but yeah, a conference yeah. and events. So as Ronnie mentioned, he, he did come and talk to Preston and I about mm -hmm. uh, creating a commemoration of the 400 years of, of, of black people in this country. So initially there was conversation about creating um, an event that would commemorate the 400 years. And, um, and I'm glad Ronnie did take this initiative and, and move forward with it. Um, because thinking about 400 years of black people in this country, I mean, there's a lot of history here, a lot of history. But as we point out, the, those first Africans arrived in 1619. They arrived as African, taken as slaves from Angola, brought here uh, to uh, Jamestown, Virginia, what they call Port Conf Point Comfort was the area which is now Hampton, that okay. area of Virginia. But those, those first Africans that arrived, because Virginia did not have a legal institution of slavery, it is believed that those Africans were treated as indentured servants. Uh, that was the pre <clears throat> predominant labor system that existed in Virginia at the time. Uh, indentured servants mostly were white men and women between the age of 15 and 25 who sold their labor um, in return for their voyage to the New World. Um, those Africans um, benefited to some extent from this system of indentured servitude. I mentioned that Anthony Johnson was able to acquire 250 acres of land uh, for being head of the household, each dependent, wow. that you were given 50 acres of land. And then he had also, uh, Johnson had acquired a white servant and a slave. But he would go on uh, and his descendants to create a farm called Angola. And that was out of Virginia, but in some part of Maryland, where they created that farm. But Johnson's uh, descendants would eventually disappear from the census records, mm. because they used the census records to track those early Africans. It is believed by 1640, when John Punch becomes the first legal slave yeah. in the colony, that mm. slavery uh, had taken root, and that th this, this concept of, of black freedom was slowly disappearing, and that the Africans that were brought into the colony now were treated as slaves. Okay. Wow. And um, Dr. Dunn, um, just, you know, just fast forwarding, mm -hmm. you know, um, and then we'll, we'll still get some more in between here of how um, blacks, Negroes, African Americans were treated in this country. Mm -hmm. Just give us, you know, some, some background on that as, you know, as, a, as it culminates with the with project. Sure. Well, it's, it's very important when we look at the the current state of black America, mm -hmm. that we look at it in the full social historical context. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in order to understand how some of the uh, conditions that exist in the black community today came about, we need to understand that history mm -hmm. of, uh, of racial oppression, where African Americans were actually property yes. and uh, were not able to acquire the means of capital, gaining capital and wealth in this country. And just as uh, inheritance can be bequeathed to uh, one's offspring and descendants, so can poverty. Mm -hmm. It can be mm -hmm. passed on and mm -hmm. inherited. So once again, when we look at uh, the conditions and what we uh, now might refer to as the ghetto, how did that come mm -hmm. to come about? Well, through government actions, policies, and practices, both formal and informal, uh, de jure laws mm -hmm. on the books mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. uh, that specified that blacks could not attend schools with whites. Yes. They mm -hmm. legally segregated our schools and uh, informal practices of racial violence that uh, segregated blacks and the, lo the least, uh, the poorest quality uh, housing in the city, or for mm -hmm. example, uh, those, those type of factors. And this current generation needs to understand that history so Absolutely. that we don't uh, misinterpret and continue this narrative of that these people are somehow deficient, thus Correct. the conditions mm -hmm. that they live in. Mm -hmm. So we need to correct the historical record and mm -hmm. make mm -hmm. it uh, so that all uh, parts of society understand where we are as a nation and how this, these conditions came to be. Correct. Mm -hmm. It's not that we couldn't do it, we just right. didn't have the opportunity right. Absolutely. To, Absolutely. to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And as Ronnie pointed out, uh, looking at black communities, 
black communities were redlined. And so black communities were considered undesirable. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at it from, we from the house, absolutely. But if you look at it from the housing standpoint, if they're not giving values to those communities, mm -hmm. then the housing values will be depressed. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, think about uh, if you're looking at a place like Glenville, which is, mm -hmm. which is definitely changing, gentrification is happening in the area. But the, but the amount that people would receive for their homes would be less than someone, say, living in Cleveland Heights or Shaker Heights, which those areas were considered desirable areas because whites inhabited those areas. Places where black people inhabited, when you look at the map, they had a map and they would show in a radius, square mile radius, what, what areas were considered to be good, bad, or uninhabitable. And so most of the black communities were considered you know, in that red zone bad, mm -hmm. where they would say that the property values were mm -hmm. significant. And if, if you link wealth to home ownership, mm -hmm. one can see how then black people are not benefiting in that way from their home ownership because their properties were considered less because the community uh, was considered undesirable. And actually, uh, to Thomas' point, mm -hmm. they, the concept of redlining mm -hmm. banks and mortgage loan uh, institutions would literally draw a red line mm -hmm. on the map mm -hmm. around communities where Afri the African American community and would not make loans mm -hmm. within those boundaries. So if the housing conditions are already of poor quality mm -hmm. and then uh, this took place during the Great Black Migration, so you have large numbers, hundreds of mm -hmm. thousands of blacks leaving the Jim Crow South, mm -hmm. uh, being run, uh, leaving behind the racial violence and lynching and oppression, yes. and coming to the North seeking mm -hmm. uh, economic as well as better social mm -hmm. uh, opportunities mm -hmm. yeah. and then to find themselves segregated and confined to these particular black areas mm -hmm. and the housing then becoming overcrowded and mm -hmm. uh, bankers, real estate agents mm -hmm. using what's known as block busting. Mm -hmm. they, when a black family would move in, they would then go to the white families mm -hmm. in the neighborhood and say, look, there's a black family down the street, you better sell mm -hmm. now before mm -hmm. your property mm -hmm. value decreases. So they would get them to sell mm -hmm. at a low price and then sell it at an exorbitantly high price to African Americans. And yeah, I personally can speak to that. My mm -hmm. family, I'm a native Clevelander, and okay. we were the third fam black family to move on my street mm -hmm. uh, over on Gay Avenue in the Mount okay. Pleasant neighborhood mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. 1964. I was three years old. Okay. and. Uh, we were the third, and that's a, a mile long span that street that we moved on, and we were the third black family. And by the time I was in the third grade, the neighborhood had transitioned wow. so rapidly. Mm -hmm. I can look at my grade school mm -hmm. class pictures okay. and see the transition. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow! <laughs> when I started kindergarten, my cl kindergarten class was probably sixty to seventy percent white. Okay. And by mm -hmm. third grade. My, it's all black. I think wow. there was one, when I graduated sixth grade, I think there was still one white student in mm -hmm. that school. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, similar to um, my neighborhood, too, over at um, Lee Harvard or Tarkington yes. mm -hmm. Avenue, and that one family, you know, stayed there, mm -hmm. and it was mm -hmm. our next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So people don't, you know, they don't believe this is real, you know, we talk about mm -hmm. it. Like sometimes, you know, we have these experiences, and they sound trivial, but it's real. Mm -hmm. And it has mm -hmm. a real effect, mm -hmm. you know, like you say, on the economics of the, on the community. And that are um, that are available, mm -hmm. and um, so at the at the um, at the conference, I know um, there's going to be like two days, uh, one mm -hmm. and a half days of um, discussion, and you talk about mobile, you know, but to mobilize people so we can create a real movement. So tell us a little bit about you know what kind of um, what are the topics basically for these panels? Well, the panel sessions will be mm -hmm. in four primary tracks: those mm -hmm. being criminal justice, education health and health disparities okay. and uh, economics. Okay. Um, so within that, some of the panels, the topics that will be discussed are police brutality, mm -hmm. racial profiling, which is my area of expertise okay. uh, in the education, school segregation. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a panel with uh, 
uh, a technology-oriented uh, educational panel with uh, three of the four uh, African-American directors of NASA uh, research centers mm -hmm. are here in the greater Cleveland area. Now, two of them will be with us awesome. as well as the moderator who's a director out at NASA, African-American female, uh, uh, Robin Gordon, okay. will be moderating mm -hmm. that panel session. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that, those, that's an example of mm -hmm. some of the, mm -hmm. the topics. Okay, and Dr. Biden, who are those um, panels? So, so for the one that I'm <clears throat> moderating on the contemporary manifestations of racism, uh, we have several individuals on that panel. But I was thinking about the one that was going to take place on Saturday on Henrietta Lacks. Okay. And uh, Alan Neville, who's the um, chair of the visiting committee for CLASS, mm -hmm. College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences, he's going to be here on that panel with um, Adrian, Dr. Adrian Gosselin. Okay. And, and then they have a literary panel that Dr. Marilyn Mobley is, is a part of that, that panel as well. But I'm, I'm hoping with the contemporary manifestation of racism, I was talking to a colleague this weekend about gentrification. Now on the surface, gentrification is a good thing. People see it as a good thing because you're revitalizing communities. But if we look a little deeper at gentrification, what's happening, you're displacing people who've called that community for a very long time their home. As, as buyers go in and purchase these homes, they, they, they sell them at a higher price, mm -hmm. thus pricing out those individuals who live in the community because they're not able to pay the property taxes because as the home value goes up, yes. property taxes are Absolutely. going to increase and people who have lived in these communities for 30 plus years mm -hmm. can no longer live in these communities because of gentrification. Mm -hmm. But then people are being displaced. Mm -hmm. uh, there, was a, there was an article in um, the Atlanta Daily Journal um, or the Atlanta Daily World, I think it was called. There was a woman who was renting a home okay. in an area that was beginning to gentrify. Mm -hmm. And the owner of that home decided, oh, this is the right time to sell the house. This is the perfect time. And so that family became displaced. Now, she had a job. She had several kids. So we're talking about the working poor. Right. But she became displaced, and then she ended up in, in the shelter. Wow. Because gentrification is moving people out of rental properties mm -hmm. in communities. As people go in and build homes, they don't want rental properties. Correct. They want home owners in those mm -hmm. homes that are not renting. Mm -hmm. And so families are being displaced. So we're hoping that that we can address some of the issues with gentrification because we told it as, you know, extol it as a good thing. Right. But it's not always a good thing when families are being displaced mm -hmm. and that, people yeah. are being removed from communities that they've called their home for a very long time. Absolutely. Because I look at some of the, um, the, the apartments or actually they call them condos mm -hmm. or the townhomes mm -hmm. and homes that are being built even, you know, from here, say, on up um, close to University Circle. Right. And some of those townhomes I looked at, they're going for $400,000, 71st in Euclid. Yeah. Now, you're talking about, is that gentrification? Mm -hmm. People in the community mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. couldn't live there. Right. You know, mm -hmm. that's, um, I couldn't live there. They're supposed <laughs> to create mixed housing. I'm trying to move back, you know, supposed to create as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. supposed to create mixed housing, right? Mm -hmm. Affordable housing for people mm -hmm. who lived in the community mm -hmm. for a very long time, but that's not happening. Yes. These yes. people are being displaced. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to have a great keynote speaker, um, Dr. Dunn. Yes, yes. We are fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Henry Lewis Gates, a renowned uh, historian, yes. particularly of African American history at mm -hmm. Harvard University. Uh, Dr. Gates uh, will be here actually for the Annisfield Wolf Book Awards, which this is Cleveland Book Week, and mm -hmm. we were Perfect. fortunate to be able to uh, obtain Dr. Gates as our keynote. He will be discussing his new book, Stony the Road, mm -hmm. uh, Reconstruction, White Supremacy, mm -hmm. and the Rise of Jim Crow. Uh, uh, and the rise of okay. Will he have his books where um, almost like a book signing or people will be able well, to purchase books? Well, they will or? be able to purchase books. Okay. Uh, his time, his time <laughs> with us is very tight, so I don't know to what extent he right, right. will be available <laughs> to sign books. But uh, like once again, we mm -hmm. were very fortunate and we definitely... Uh, Appreciate his gracious. Yeah, absolutely, and, yes. And yeah, people are looking forward to, to, um, yeah. to being with mm -hmm. us. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So that's exciting. 
And I um, just want to get back again. So this is not just uh, this weekend. This is a whole year long of events and the different you know communities involved. Just want to um, kind of you know lighten us about that. Yes, uh, as we said, this is the kickoff of a year-long observation mm -hmm. of uh, the 400-year uh, anniversary of the arrival of or, uh, the first Africans brought to uh, what is now the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's meant to be not only reflective in, on that 400-year history, mm -hmm. but also catalytic in nature in that we see this as the uh, the advent of sustained efforts to mm -hmm. eradicate the, mm -hmm. the present manifestations mm -hmm. of racism, structural mm -hmm. institutional racism, that are still impacting our, our, our country right. and society. Yeah, yeah. so you just yeah. talked about um, Jim Crow earlier mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, bringing that up till today, mm -hmm. right. having the different experiences we still have when I experience, you know, something, you know, over the weekend. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, just, just brought up all that old, Mm -hmm. The old feeling, old emotion mm -hmm. yes. of, um, mm -hmm. of being um, discriminated against. So, right. yeah. So. yeah. Because, you know, people, uh, as I said um, um, earlier, uh, people tend to think that racism is an individual act of discrimination mm -hmm. and that it's an individual act of violence. And we've confined it to that. And so a lot of our students have that understanding of racism. But racism is systemic, it's embedded in policies, it's embedded in practices, it's institutionalized. Yes. And they need to understand it's institutionalized because mm -hmm. if it wasn't institutionalized, then black people would have been able to forge ahead mm -hmm. much faster mm -hmm. and to move out in a society that was fully inclusive. But there are policies in place, there are practices in place to keep black people on the fringes of society. And we, and, and we, we need uh, people to really take that under consideration and hopefully the conference will bring that conversation to the forefront yes. so people can walk away being cognizant mm -hmm. that racism is not some individual act that's that it's more than just the individual act and we see it in today's society we see it with the cultural wars that are happening mm -hmm. we see it with the with 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 people saying we need to get rid of the confederate monument mm -hmm. why are they useful today um why are they still a part of society? Why are they a part of public property? Yes. Right. In the South, we're fighting that battle. Mm -hmm. When I was at Middle Tennessee State, there's a building on that campus named after Nathan Bedford Forrest. Mm -hmm. Nathan Bedford Forrest was the grand wizard of the KKK. Mm -hmm. Wow. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a man after black soldiers surrendered at Fort Pillow, mm -hmm. uh, r right before you get to Memphis, they were slaughtered. Mm -hmm. um, and so here's a person that you're, you're, you're uh, celebrating. Commemorating. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> His name is on a public building. Students mm -hmm. who are part of the military don't see a connection with him. Mm -hmm. And so in their mind, they're preserving a history of him as a military hero. Yes. Mm -hmm. In our minds, they're preserving a history mm -hmm. of a man who was a slave and trader and a bank. racist. Because mm -hmm. yeah. 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 You, so, you want to get rid of you know, part of the history, but the other part, if you get rid of that, then you're erasing... Right. The other part, so what do we... That's why we have museums, right? So we keep, people can go and pay and Absolutely. see that history, but it shouldn't be a part mm -hmm. of a public building. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we don't want to forget. Absolutely. Because mm -hmm. yeah. if we forget, then we won't know where we're going. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, there won't be any yeah. understanding yeah. of yeah. that subtlety. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we talk about implicit bias. You want to speak to that um, a little bit, sure. Dr. Uh, <laughs> well, and actually... Um, the concept of implicit bias, uh, it, it stems from the field of social psychology. Mm -hmm. And as you're, uh, I'm sure you're aware, but many of us aren't, and we're, we're beginning to have discussions around that and that in the spring we had Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt as mm -hmm. our keynote yes. speaker yes. at the uh, our diversity awards lunch and then mm -hmm. Dr. Eberhardt is a social psychologist from Stanford. She's a MacArthur Genius uh, Award Fellow and her research uh, looks at implicit bias and she uh, actually had just released her book, Bias, uh, the way that our hidden prejudice impacts our day-to-day -day actions mm -hmm. or decisions that we make. And implicit bias is uh, this concept that we all are impacted by and all have that indicates that 
despite our consciously held values or beliefs, we still act on these implicit biases that we have, and particularly around race. We're socialized in a racially stratified society where whites are at the top of that hierarchy and African Americans and other people of color are gradated along that mm -hmm. hierarchy mm -hmm. and at the lower pole mm -hmm. you have. It mm -hmm. depends on what region of the country, but some would say African Americans are at that lower pole. Others mm -hmm. might say Native American or Mexicans. Mm -hmm. But uh, regardless, the point is that uh, we unconsciously and unwittingly mm -hmm. act on these implicit biases mm -hmm. in our day-to-day -day interactions. I actually use an instrument called the Implicit Association Test in all of the courses that I've taught in my time here at CSU, which okay. has been over 15 years mm -hmm. now. We need to have that HR. <laughs> <laughs> that measures uh, your uh, unconscious biases. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that discussion is relevant into addressing these issues of systemic and structural mm -hmm. racism mm -hmm. okay. because people of good heart and mind still can mm -hmm. act in a way that they Absolutely. aren't aware that negatively and adversely impacts uh, mm -hmm. people of color mm -hmm. in, in particular. Mm -hmm. And there are other biases against gender, mm -hmm. uh, sexual orientation, mm -hmm. weight even. Okay. And they have a series of tests that you can take to measure each of those. Yeah. But wow. once you become cognizant or conscious of these biases that mm -hmm. we all have, mm -hmm. then you can begin to, there are strategies to help offset and diminish the impact that they have on our decision making. Mm -hmm. So that is relevant in this discussion of race and racism. Absolutely. And that if we're going to ever truly advance all mm -hmm. citizens, everyone needs Absolutely. to take a look at their own uh, own selves and yes. the way that they are impacted mm -hmm. by yeah. yes. so you start pointing that finger, right? Let's, let's right. Those three. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> pointing right back at us. Absolutely. Yeah, well, awesome. This has been an um, awesome conversation um, with, um, with the two of you here today. It was really you know, thank you for, for giving me your, your time sure. really, you know, help promote the event and um, the university um, as well through this um, through this conversation. So is there anything else that, wanna, um, that you want to cover? So we, we talked about some of the timeline, you know, the history um, background, mm -hmm. you know, overall objectives that, mm -hmm. that we want to talk about, you know, as we close down. Well, uh, just uh, let people know they can go mm -hmm. to our website, okay. project 400csuohioedu mm -hmm. okay. and find information on upcoming activities. Mm -hmm. We'll have a calendar of events. As we said, this is a year-long observation, mm -hmm. and that calendar will mm -hmm. continually be evolving. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be activities, events that people can engage in, not only here on campus, but okay. throughout the broader community. Mm -hmm. And Great. we do have other community partners in, mm -hmm. involved with us, Case Western Reserve. Several of our panelists are from Oberlin. Okay. I've had conversations with the Chief Diversity Officer at Kent State about also potentially engaging with us throughout the year. So once again, uh, collaborating with our partner uh, higher education yes. institutions mm -hmm. as well, as well as other community organizations okay. to continue this important dialogue. And, and I also like to add that mm -hmm. the Black Studies program will be okay. celebrating 50 years. Um, wow. We're going to have a 50th mm -hmm. year celebration October the 12th, okay. 5.30 in the Student Center Ballroom. Mm -hmm. Our keynote speaker will be Melba Boyd from okay. Wayne State University. Mm -hmm. And so we're inviting everyone to come out. You can RSVP on our website, um, yeah, the Black that. Studies website. Okay. Um, and if you go, and I often tell people, if you go to uh, the, the link A to Z and just click on B, <laughs> click on Black Studies, <laughs> it'll take you right there okay, to the website. Okay, so this is on so, the CSUOhio.edu yes, CSU, yes, website. website. Go to A to Z, Z and Z. click on B. <laughs> <laughs> take you right there to the Black Absolutely. Study. Yes, uh, yes. And I'll get some information yes. out, you know, about that Absolutely. as well, you know, through all, through all my networks. Yeah, that'll be great. Okay. Okay. Post that the show yes. as well. Okay, well, again, thanks again. I really appreciate yes. your time. Right. This has been thank amazing. You. Yes, thank you. And you go out and you make something awesome happen in your community. To showcase on MakeSomethingHappen.tv or appear on any of our web shows, email studio at mwmg.tv. That's studio at mwmg.tv.